Welcome back. This is uh, week five, lecture one. Um, what is it? Social unrest and the radical reformation. And this um, lecture begins this the last part of this course, part three. Um, and I, as I think I mentioned uh, in last week's lecture, uh, before your midterm, um, it's really mistitled. Um, this part of the course, um, it's they said patterns of reformation really doesn't get at uh, what it is because, as I think I already mentioned, it bears mentioning again. Um, as I see things, the Reformation of the later Middle Ages was a pattern of Reformation. Luther's Reformation is a pattern of Reformation. And we'll be looking at other patterns of Reformation uh, in this third part of the course. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I also then noticed, going back and looking at the syllabus, that uh, perhaps my uh, trouble with the term patterns of Reformation um, unconsciously made its way to the syllabus, syllabus because there I have part three labeled as patterns of Reformation, leaving out the end. Um, and so it's not really designed to um, <laughs> come across the way it should. <coughs> that title, <coughs> excuse me, that title is... Um, um, not the, the, the best in any case. Um, and I haven't really come up with a better one. I've been working actually, um, uh, thinking of the, the denominalization of Europe. Um, I'll be talking here about the confessionalization, uh, later, uh, in, in week six, I believe it will be, but, um, in some ways the whole, uh, this whole part could be referred to as confessionalization. I'll be, as again, later talking about <coughs> what that means, <coughs> but what it really, I, I'm really getting at is the spread of the Reformation movements. Uh, it's really not quite the case that we have, you know, late medieval Reformation and then, um, Luther, and then coming out from Luther, different branches. But yet there's an element that that is really the case, because the case of Luther sets off um, a kind of a, a, the powder keg that sets off an explosion that kind of goes through uh, the rest of society in some ways. And this then also starts getting at um, your, your final because you had part one and then a midterm, part two and a midterm, and then this part three, final part, is your final. The midterms, both one and two, uh, are designed to help prepare and get you ready for the final. And so the final is a comprehensive question where I, you will be expected to deal with uh, the entire course, basically, to apply to the question of, when it boils down to it, was the Reformation a revolution? Uh, there is no right or wrong answer to that, um, but one of the things, and I'll be talking more about the, the final uh, in, in the last lecture or so, um, but one of the things you'll need to do is ask yourselves and address in your essay, uh, in your exam, what constitutes revolution? Um, what is a revolution? Um, and then can we apply that term to the developments uh, in, in Europe from approximately 1300 to approximately 1600? Um, I've stressed, I think, uh, in the lectures throughout the, the terms we use, the concepts we use, the categories we use to describe what we see as change and developments affect our understanding if not condition our understanding of that, and to refer to the Reformation as a revolution, because that, that is a loaded term. Now, the term revolution, um, the first time we really see it in the West, uh, is with Copernicus, uh, who published his um, uh, On the Revolution of the Heavens, De um, Revolutionibus Celestium, in, in 1543. So right smack dab in the middle of, of our course. Um, and that refers to the turning, the, the revolving of something. Now, with history, do we really see a revolving? Do we really see a change? But that kind of revolution starts being referred to as a type of historical change. We have uh, the historians, what the historians have labeled various re revolutions uh, in England, the Glorious Revolution. Um, we have the French Revolution, the American Revolution. Um, and those are all terms of major changes of government, major changes of society. 
what though constitutes revolutionary change from simply normal, quote-unquote normal, historical change or non-revolutionary change? Can there be um, extensive, significant change that is not revolutionary? What brings it about? And what we're really looking at in some ways is all part of all of this um, prefatory comment to not only the third part of this course, but the course as such, um, is a change of paradigms. A paradigm is a word uh, that is used, or at least as I'm using it here, um, comes from the uh, philosopher and historian of science, Thomas Kuhn. I uh, talked about the Copernican revolution, I talked about the scientific revolution. Um, and what he argues is that there is a form of understanding, in this case, um, scientific understanding. Uh, he also has a, a discussion of the forms of, uh, of scientific revolutions, um, whereby there is a common understanding of how the universe works. And we, we make new discoveries are made to start to challenge that and pick away at it. And then at some point, a new idea comes about that most people reject. And actually with Copernicus, it was not uh, 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 the issue that religion or theology rejected Copernicus. It was certainly not that Catholics rejected Copernicus or that Protestants rejected Copernicus. The best scientists of the day rejected Copernicus. It didn't make sense. It didn't make sense within what was observable and what always had, seen, had been seen as the truth. But after a while, new observations, new calculations start making it almost impossible to ignore. And Copernicus sent his treatise on, on revolution of the heavens to the Pope. And the Pope actually used it, thought it was fine, used it to help um, revise the calendar. Because the old medieval, classical medieval Ptolemaic system with the earth at the center of the universe uh, and the sun circling around the, the earth um, worked very well in general. Uh, and we still today, when we talk about, you know, the sun rising and the sun setting, um, that is a pre-Copernican uh, image, um, but we still use it because it kind of is in sync with our experience. But once we start saying, you know what? There is too much information that is coming along to ignore. And when Galileo starts seeing new things, because Galileo used a telescope, which Copernicus did not. Uh, he didn't have a telescope available to him. Galileo you know, develops a telescope, um, and then he sees things like uh, the rings around Saturn. He sees, you know, craters and mountains on the moon, um, and he sees physical evidence for what could not have existed within the Ptolemaic system. And I can talk a lot about that and go through it, and maybe I should have. Um, and I've even uh, already started uh, saying a lot more than I was originally planning about the term revolution. Um, but it's an issue of when it can no longer be maintained on a rational basis, the previous paradigm that we get, then get to see a shift of paradigm. And it wasn't then really this until Newton and Newton's kind of theories in his Principia um, that we have a new paradigm being established. And so there's this period of transition from the old paradigm to the new. Looking back on it, we can say it's a revolution because what came before the old paradigm and what ended up developing the new paradigm are radically different. There's a radical change. But was it a revolutionary change that brought about that revolution in paradigms? Um, so I'm, I'm just bringing these concepts up and these ideas up in the, for you to consider as you're working on the final and the question for the final, and as we're looking through this, the rest of this course and working on the re this rest of this course, um, in terms of the definition of the terms that we use. And that is what the final is getting at. And so you can't really answer that question without defining what it means, what revolution means, or at least how you're using it in that context. And then the other aspect is not a uh, 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 whole shebang, yes or no, 
Um, there can be elements that are revolutionary, that were revolutionary. There can be um, revolutionary change in some areas, but not in others. And so it's not a, 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 the whole thing all at once. I know I'm, I'm struggling for words here. And I'm not sure um, if, if my point is coming across. But for your final, you can say that in some ways, the, you know, in some aspects, the Reformation was a revolution. In other ways, it wasn't. Um, that's legitimate. Um, and that then gets at, finally, coming back to what we're looking at today in terms of social unrest and the Radical Reformation. Um, because this lecture is going back and looking at some of the, the, the social developments um, and what led to radical change, if there was radical change. Now, I'll be talking about the um, so-called German Peasants War of 1525, um, and that was put down uh, very strongly um, by Catholic and Protestant princes, and I'll be talking again more about that when we get there. Um, but it has been seen by Marxist historians in Germany as in the failed bourgeois revolution that it was there, and only if it had succeeded, Germany would have had a very different development in, in the eyes of you know Friedrich Engels, who wrote a book on the German Peasants' War, um, and others, of course, too. Um, Germany would have been a lot better off had it indeed succeeded, had there actually been this revolutionary movement that had taken over and accomplished what it set out to accomplish. Now, you will be reading the 12 Articles of Peasants, uh, for this week, and you can see, and then to ask yourselves, to what extent is this revolutionary? And whereas it might look revolutionary on, on one level, um, when we go back and look at the articles in comparison to the Reformation of the Emperor Sigismund, which um, I know I talked about in terms of almost the um, paradigmatic uh, treatise for the Reformation of the later Middle Ages. There's a lot of similarities in that there had been peasant unrest. There had been peasant rebellions for quite a long time, um, from the later Middle Ages on into the 16th century. But what constitutes revolutionary change or revolutionary uprisings from simply, let's say, normal rebellions and unrest and calls for change? There are tensions um, that were there, and... The reformers, such as Luther, were trying to tap into that. That's what, in some ways, they were doing with the propaganda campaign, with the use of images and spreading the words that I talked about um, a couple weeks ago or so. Um, and they knew that that popular level was there. And in fact, what was so shocking to Luther in the visitation reports was that, you know, that popular level really hadn't been affected that much. And I'll be talking more about this in a, in a shortly. Um, so what are we really getting at? What are we trying to change? What were the reformers trying to change? Was it simply enough to, um, uh, to articulate doctrine and then have the political backing for it? And then what was radical? Was Luther radical? Was Calvin, as I'll be talking about um, in the next lecture, was Calvin radical? What constitutes radical? Uh, now, in 1963, I think it was, George Hunston Williams wrote a very thick book called The Radical Reformation. Uh, and the name has stuck ever since. And it is a very diverse um, a set of developments, um, and I'll be talking more about that as we go through uh, this lecture. Um, so it was not a unified thing, so to speak. We can't really look at the Radical Reformation the same way in many ways that we look, can look at Luther's Reformation or even Calvin's Reformation in Geneva, um, which I'll be talking about next lecture, or the English Reformation, and on we go. But I'll be getting to those points uh, as well a, a little bit later in, in, in today's lecture. So we're looking at this kind of ongoing substratum of social understanding, belief, practices, unrest, rebellion, and then the reformers attempt to tap into that in the way that they see best and 
best fit. The, 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 again, I'm having a really difficult time this morning uh, formulating coherent, articulate sentences. And so my, my apologies for that. Um, but, I, but again, I hope my meaning gets across. And we'll, I, if some of this does, I hope it will as we get into more of the details in the course of this lecture. But that is kind of where, uh, or why I put these two together, social unrest and um, the, the Radical Reformation. Chronologically, we kind of ended uh, with the Confession of Augsburg in 1530, the second part of the course. This part of the course then goes back to some even medieval developments um, and then continues uh, further on with the other patterns or patterns or denominalizations, um, manifestations of Reformation with Calvin, uh, the Catholic Reformation, and on we will go. Now, I hope this kind of, again, very inelegant, um, I hope not completely incoherent introduction uh, sets the stage. Um, this week, if you look at the syllabus, there is a fair amount of, uh, of reading. I think this may be the, the, the heaviest load of reading for this week. You'll be reading the 12 Articles of the Peasants. You'll be reading um, Thomas Munzer's um, Sermon to the Princes, uh, which is his commentary on second chapter of Daniel. And you'll be reading Calvin's um, Letter to Francis I, which was uh, the preface to every edition beginning in 1536 of his Institutes of the Christian, of the Christian Religion. And I'll be again talking about that uh, next lecture, uh, as well as in chapters of the textbook. So there is a lot, um, but then um, that's almost about it. You have Lindbergh next week uh, and then final. So um, I'm not really going to apologize. I just hope that you can get to it and get through it um, and um, use the text as the basis for answering your final question. Uh, and therefore the 12 articles, and I'll be talking about the 12 articles a bit today, um, are going to be very important, as is Munster's, if we're going to really talk about revolution, what constitutes revolutionary change. And was that radical? Can we have radical reformation that is not revolutionary? To what extent and what other different aspects or manifestations of reformation that fit into this category of radical because the category of radical um, is a very broad category i'll be addressing that um, shortly in, in more detail as well that being said now if i can see in my little time clicker here. It's been already 18 minutes it's simply to introduce this part of the course, set the stage, I hope, um, so to speak, um, and um, get us ready for this lecture and where we're going from here for the rest of the course, looking towards the final. I won't be doing the same type of extensive introduction to the next lecture. Uh, but I wanted to do that to just to kind of, again, give the overview of where we're going in this third part and what it's leading to and what it's all about. Given that, we can now then turn to the first slide after the introduction, after the title slide, which is popular religion, because what we are really trying to look at with these some of these developments is what difference did Luther's, you know, theological works, his biblical commentaries, really, what did it have, have, what impact did it have on, on the people, on the social level? And certainly even his propaganda campaign, did that really, was that really effective? Did it really reach the minds and hearts and understandings? Because that was what Luther was about, or at least one aspect of what he was about. And that's what kind of set off his uh, the movement as as a whole the, the whole issue with indulgences for Luther was a pastoral issue because his parishioners in his mind were being fleeced flocked and lied to and he wanted to defend his par parishioners so we'll be looking at that connection between academic theology and popular belief but we're going to begin um, with popular religion 
in official religion and popular religion. Now, uh, this distinction, I think, is uh, an important one um, because they are different. Um, they're different levels of society and culture. If you can think of it as um, even today we have you know, high culture, what we think of or what is referred to as, um, you know, if you go to the symphony and you go to the opera and you are ever so civilized and cultured, um, you don't use vulgar language, at least not in public. Um, you have your manners and your attire. That is culture and that is significant, um, but it's very different from listening to, you know, rap music, wearing you know, jeans that are all torn up and that kind of aspect, if that makes sense. That is more popular culture. Um, and so we can talk about the, the distinctions between popular culture and official high culture. We can also talk about official religion and popular religion. Official religion are the teachings and the doctrines put out by the institution of the church, the hierarchy, of what is the official position and the official ways to practice the religion that it is being that is being espoused. So for Christianity, whether it is in medieval Christendom uh, or even with Luther and what he was establishing as he's making his change, the official religion would be going to worship or going to mass, going to worship, um, you know, partaking in the sacraments. Again, still differences between the you know, medieval view and the Catholic view and then Luther's view and other views as we go through. Um, and learning what you were supposed to learn. That was all part, part of the official religion. Whereas popular re religion then is what did people actually believe? What did people actually think they were doing when they were performing these rituals, um, the, the you know, going to mass? And we see this you know, already in, in the Middle Ages, there's this distinction. Um, and there's all kinds of... of evidence for it just with one with just with the eucharist um you know the the designation of what happens in the, in the elevation in the, in the mass in terms of transubstantiation based on aristotelian physics um that was defined by the fourth lateran council in 1215 that's part of official religion the official doctrine of course then that is then practiced the, the religion in every mass that is what is going on but what so often um common people not just peasants but i mean peasants technically but the common people what they see is that this is magic this is magical what's going on in the mass is oh my god the, the priest is bringing god here present this is a power source and so we have you know accounts of common people you know pretending to receive the host um but then you know taking it out and putting it and then bringing it home and giving it to their horse uh who was sick or their cow who was sick or planting it in their garden or in their fields hoping that it would help because this is an issue of you know this is god and this is going to be wonderful if it can help me it can also help my horse now, those practices those beliefs um were not sanctioned by the powers that be, so to speak, um, but they were there. You know, the Christmas tree is part of popular religion. It's a pagan um, uh, symbol. It had been from very early on. And one of the geniuses in terms of Christianity and, and Christianization was to accept whatever was already there in the religion and the culture and just make just Christianize it, so we can see that in some ways that um, you know the the cult of the saints as it had developed was popular religion that then became sanctioned by official religion. Um, you know, popular rituals like the, the Christmas ritual and Christmas trees. You know, it's a, a fertility symbol of evergreen and life and growth. Well, that fits very naturally with some of the Christian ideas and doctrines of ever life, evergreen. Um, it's a symbol that is there. So let's use that and make it, bring it into the Christian fold. But in so doing, Christianity brought a lot of what have been pagan beliefs and practices and rituals in. Um, they tried to 
Christianity as such, they um, tried to adapt whatever they could of the popular religion at the time to the official religion of the church. And that continued in the Reformation um, to a large extent. And when we see the, the propaganda and the images that are being put out there, the use of scatological language, that is very much a cultural aspect of popular culture, popular thought and belief, and Luther is trying to tie into that. Now, can there be a revolution of popular religion? And that is really difficult. Um, and how do we reach it? And this brings up then the distinction between academic theology and popular belief. Um, academic theology is what theologians do at the universities. Um, Luther was an academic theologian at the university, as were many of the great theologians, you know, before. It is an academic discipline, it had been since the rise of the universities, um, if not even before. Um, um, the university came about in the late 12th, early 13th century. Um, whereas, you know, popular belief is, again, part of popular culture, popular religion, it's what people actually believe. And so the Academic theology is trying to shape and inform popular belief. And they do that by means of what's called pastoral theology, preaching, teaching, it tries to bridge these two sides. So this, we have official religion, we have academic theology up here, we have the popular religion and popular belief here. And the attempt to make that bridge is with teaching and preaching and pastoral theology and not you know there is a, a gap there because how do you relate let's say very difficult complex doctrines and theological positions that are debated amongst them uh, amongst theologians at universities how do you make that transition to teach that to common people without the education without the background even with you know out the care or concern how do you make that transition? And so pastoral theology attempts to make that bridge to the extent possible. But pastoral theology isn't always um, in accordance with academic theology, especially when we have people starting to preach who maybe are, are not trained sufficiently, um, are more interested in reaching people and motivating people and, and moving people than they are in whether the the doctrine is correct um and it becomes a very big problem and it's a problem still for christianity today and i would probably say for every religion um making that transition from the academic position to the popular practice and understanding thereof that leads then to the issue of superstition um and superstition uh, i'm not going to even try to, to give a, a definition of it but it is always an out group term um you know no one at the time said yes i'm superstitious you know today people might say are you superstitious yes you know if uh, i try not to step on cracks as i walk on the sidewalk i don't walk under a ladder i try to avoid black cats if i see them and certainly you know not to have them go through um friday the 13th is always something that i'm like ooh, i hope nothing bad happens today those are all superstitions we have them. We are superstitious. You know, if we go to, uh, with our favorite sports team, if we go, we may wear, you know, the same shirt or the same jersey because that is, that's what we do. Um, that's our lucky jersey that will help. Those are all superstitions in that they cannot be um, substantiated based on scientific rational principles. There is a level of superstition in all popular belief and popular culture. But what constitutes superstition from um, legitimate belief in culture and practice depends on what position you're coming from. Um, and so it's kind of, if someone says that is superstition, that means that the person who says that is claiming that that belief or practice is less and it's not substantiated. It's, it's really, it, it's irrational. It should not be allowed. We need to wipe out superstition. But there is then a wide spectrum kind of, of what constitutes superstition based on who is making the claim that that is superstitious, if that makes sense. Um, you know, today we can all say, yeah, I'm kind of superstitious. And yet we realize what we're 
being what we're doing. Um, you know, we can wear our lucky jersey and we know that it really doesn't have an effect on whether or not our team wins or not, but we feel that it does. And we may even laugh at ourselves, but we still do it because it's part of the culture and kind of part of the fun. <coughs> that is what I'm trying to get at here, that, that official religion, academic theology, viewed a lot of popular belief as superstitious. Now, if we use that term, we have to be careful because it, what it does, it, it almost signifies what what, uh, what the thoughts are of the person labeling something as being superstitious more than it does the actual practice itself. Uh, so be careful if, when you use those words. I'm not saying don't, but just be aware of what you're doing. Um, and, you know, there are people, not in the 16th century, uh, who might say that all religion is just superstition. Um, and that, you know, I don't believe that for a second, actually. Um, but there are people who, who kind of think that. Uh, and that, that says more about them than uh, it does about anybody else uh, or the people who maybe do not believe that. Um, and belief, as I've argued through, um, you know, an atheistic position is as much based on belief as is a theistic position. And we can debate all that, but that gets us far away from what we're actually looking at here. But it is this tension between official religion, academic theology, and popular religion, and popular belief that we see kind of the, the field in which social unrest and revolutionary movements, I'm not saying revolution, but revolutionary movements, rebellion, revolt, grow up. And it kind of is formulated within that context. And so when we're looking at the radical reformation, what becomes radicalized? What makes it to, what makes something to be radical? Because radical simply means uh, getting at the root. When we look at rebellion and unrest, not all rebellion, not even all revolt is necessarily radical, depending again on how we use the term. And since we're going to be looking at um, the peasant wars uh, and peasant uprisings and rebellions in the 16th century, we need to, too, um, as we do with all of these developments that I've been talking about, see them in context of the late medieval uh, unrest, peasant unrest, because certainly um, it was not new in the 16th century. Um, and when we do look at you know, the Reformation of the Emperor Sigismund, as I discussed in the first part of the course, um, there are grievances about taxes and tolls and, and already indulgences um, and about how things are, are being done, how the common people are being mistreated by the lords who are not doing their jobs. Um, and there's a lot of sense of that in the late medieval unrest, peasant unrest and peasant rebellions um, that also were put down eventually or so, uh, but were there that we're simply going back to, you know, are they radical? Or they're going back to the roots of traditional rights of the peasants. Um, and I have up there um, in the second slide now, or third slide, um, late medieval peasant unrest. Because, again, it was nothing new in the 16th century. There were peasant uprisings in France and in England in the later 14th century. Um, there had been early on um, some major developments and unrest and critiques uh, already in the 12th century, uh, going on to the 13th century, with respect to the church and the wealth of the church. And the first entry there under uh, slide three, late medieval peasant unrest, is the critique of the institutional church, late medieval poverty controversies. Um, and I think I may have mentioned some of this in one of the early lectures in terms of medieval Christendom, talking about the mendicants, the monks, and the poverty issue, and uh, the Franciscans um, who claimed that they were the most perfect imitators of Christ because they were uh, owned no property, um, and you know the church owned their property. And I think I mentioned talking about John, Pope John the Twenty Second. 
um, that he thought that was ridiculous. And so he said, I'm giving you back your property. You have to, you know, take it. I'm not going to hold it for you and allow you to be hypocrites. Uh, but even before that 14th century poverty controversy problem came about, um, there were major critiques of the papacy and the institutional church already in the, in the later 12th century. Because you know, it's like, what? As the church is an institution, as the institutional, as the ecclesiastical hierarchy is becoming increasingly wealthy and powerful in adopting the position basically uh, the same as, as territorial lay princes, there are people who said, you know, wait a minute, that's not how Jesus lived. Jesus was poor. He was an itinerant preacher. We know that. And what you're doing, you popes and bishops and even sometimes maybe parish priests and monks and everything. You're just amassing wealth and power for yourself. That is not Christianity. What's Jesus say? It's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. That is counter to everything that is Christian. In groups grew up, and we talk, talk about the, the poor of, of Lyon as one in France. We talk about the Waldensians uh, in, in Italy. Um, and there was a real poverty movement of critique against the institutional church. Now, the institutional church, the hierarchy, the ecclesiastical hierarchy, condemned these movements as being heretical. Because, of course, you can't say well, you're critiquing us, saying that our lives are all wrong, and saying that's all good because we <laughs> we are wrong. Um, that's not really a tenable position to have. That's why when they when, when, when Pope Innocent III accepted Francis in St. Francis's vow of poverty, it was, gave the church an out, so to speak, because it's like, okay, you know, we represent the risen Christ, we're the... Obviously, the life of Christ, as Christ was living and walking around, Jesus of Nazareth was not a wealthy individual. But Jesus, after the ascension, as the second person of Trinity sitting on the right hand of God, is the judge of the entire universe. That's what we represent. And so if we have been amiss, maybe, in acknowledging that life of Christ as Jesus was living and teaching and preaching— now we have the means to, to accept that within the boundaries of orthodoxy, within the boundaries of the institutional hierarchy, by accepting and confirming the Franciscans and the Dominicans and the Augustinians in their roles as mendicants, as poor beggars in society. That tension was there already. Um, but that didn't alleviate some of the real social needs of the peasants, who I think I said, especially as we get into the later 13th century and on into the 14th century, um, there are rebellions because the lower nobility is being squeezed financially. They pass that on. They start restricting peasant rights, traditional rights and privileges, hunting, fishing, collecting firewood, and they start taxing those or saying that you, know, that you can't do that unless you pay us. And so the peasants are like, wait, wait a minute, we can't live either then. You're trying to keep us from our means of livelihood. Okay, you know, give us our traditional rights as peasants. Those are the sources of the rebellions. The sources of you know, saying we're happy to be peasants. That's not what it's about. This is not about equality. There's no concept of equality. The concept of equality was we are all children of God. That was known there. That was nothing new in the Reformation. That was the preached consistently. And so that comes as a warning to nobles or to people of power. Be aware that you need to treat your subjects and your peasants well because they are equal to you in God's eyes in terms of you know, the kingdom of heaven. But in this world, there is opposition. There is inequality. There is the social structure that is there to help, um, to make sin more difficult. That's the function of government in some ways. In our fallen world, we need government. There won't be government in heaven. Augustine says that, Jordan Quinlan preaches that, you know, in, in heaven there's no, 
you know, there's no kings and princes. We're all the same, basically. Or if there's any kind of distinction, it's based on the nature of our souls and not on, on our positions in this world. And government restrains individuals from committing evil against other individuals. It also then helps to provide the good. That was a, the form of government. That was what government was about. And that gives to, or was the basis to, uh, for the feeling of responsibility. If I'm a lord, if I'm a noble, uh, I'm responsible for the well-being of my peasants, of my subjects. I am responsible for them. And very so much, a very much a, a parental understanding. It's like, okay, you know, parents, I don't know if, you know, well, I know, actually, I do know that some of you are parents. Um, uh, you know what I'm talking about, because we are responsible for our children. Um, not that we do a perfect job by any means, or at least I can, maybe I should just speak for myself. Um, we make mistakes, but we're, we try, we hope, we want to, um, guide them in paths that will be beneficial for them. Um, and if they don't, okay, that's a problem. But we do a better job than if we said, okay, I'm not, you know, hands off, we're all equal, you can do whatever. That's completely um, shunning our responsibility. So that was what the mentality was of the princes and the, the kings and the emperors and so on. We are responsible physically and morally and well for the well-being of our people. We need to take that responsibility. I know I've stressed that before, but I wanted to put it in this context. So that equality was not an issue. And the peasants never said that we are equal uh, and we demand to be equal with you and we all vote and have, you know, that's it. Ugh, that was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and the same thing we'll see in the 12 Articles of Peasants. Um, they uh, appeal to the equality before Christ uh, in the eyes of God, but not in this world. They say, you know, we will be peasants. We're not saying we shouldn't be peasants. We don't want to be treated like slaves. I mean, you know, slavery is a kind of a problem, even though Paul said, you know, should, masters should be good to your slaves and slaves should be obedient to your masters. You don't say that you know, there shouldn't be slaves at all. You know, fine. Okay. Um, what do we do with that? Now, you know, the, the 12 articles, when we get there, we'll see, and as you will read, do uh, assert that human beings should not be owned by other human beings. There's an element of an appeal to human dignity that is there based on the equality within, uh, of individuals within God's eyes. But it's not not to be peasants. Now, I'll come back to that when we get there. Um, in Germany, there was a series of uprisings, and certainly the, the Peasants' War of uh, 1525, when we get there, was not the first. Um, and a very um, significant movement was called the Bundschu, um, which was just uh, the term for the Peasants' Boot, and that became the symbol of this movement of peasant resistance um, to being mistreated, in their views, by their lords. Um, and this was never really settled. It's just unrest and rebellion and protests, let's say, um, discontent. Um, and that was an ongoing kind of festering problem there. And then we have a list of gravamina put forward, not just from peasants, but also by you know artisans and peoples in the cities, formulating it to the Imperial Reichstag at Worms, all of which also included um, you know indulgences and the, the the wrong preaching of the indulgences how were being you know fleeced by these damn indulgence talkers. That was part of this list of gravamina. At the same time that Luther was appearing before Worms. Now Nothing happened to that, that list of gravamina. It wasn't really dealt with at forms or any time thereafter. And this kind of led to this sense of something is wrong and we have to, to do more. Uh, we have to become more radical, which brings me then to what constitutes radical. And up here, um, talking too about patterns of reformation, so to speak. Um, uh, one general term that's often used is a distinction between the magisterial reformation and the radical reformation the magisterial reformation 
I have it there. It says Luther's Reformation, the Reformation of the Refugees, which I'll be talking about uh, in the next lecture. The English Reformation, which I'm not really going to be lecturing on, but it is in uh, your textbook. And hope you will read about it in your textbook, even though there's all kinds of fun things to talk about. Um, but And then the counter Catholic Counter-Reformation, uh, which I'll be talking about a bit uh, next week. Magisterial comes from uh, magistrates. Uh, the magisterial reformation is a reformation that was led by magistrates. Magistrates are people in political authority and power. It can be a city council, where the, the magistrates of the city council it can be princes. Um, it can be the emperor himself. These are all magistrates, and so reformation movements led by, um, supported by, instituted by magistrates are referred to as the Magisterial Reformation. The Radical Reformation was not that. So we can't really say that the Radical Reformation was the same or just a different manifestation. It's a different pattern, to use that word uh, consciously here. Um, it was a pattern of Reformation that was not Magisterial. It was different. And what was so different about it is it lacked any political base. There is no territory or prince that adopted the positions of those individuals we refer to as the Radical Reformation. We will see that there was an attempt to establish a political base, and it was viciously put down as so much so as was the Peasants' War. The Peasants' War are not claiming, the Peasants are not claiming to, to establish their own state. They are simply saying we want our traditional rights to be acknowledged as equal in the eyes of God, but not in this world. Definitely not in this world. We know that we're we're, we're happy to be peasants, but things need to change so that we can be peasants. Now, theological positions in terms of the radical Reformation, which I said you know is a very wide, diverse term. So in some ways, the radical Reformation refers to all those manifestations of reformation that lacked a political base, a political territorial base, and yet still called out for radical change based on their understanding of the scriptures. Now, let's just look at some of the um, theological positions, because it's very difficult to um, generalize about the Radical Reformation, as I've already said, the category is far too broad, the spectrum is too broad, but there are some commonalities in general that we can look at. And the first one I'm going to bring up there is mysticism and dissent. Um, it's a great book by Stephen Osmond, um, one of his first books, um, and uh, it was one of his best ones. Uh, it's, and then he went and started writing too much, including writing a book called The Reformation as Revolution. Um, anyway, um, mysticism, and I may have addressed this before in a previous lecture, I don't remember. Mysticism is a, is a problem. It's always a problem for Christianity, always, always had been. Because the powers that be, uh, the princes and, or the bishops and the parish priests and bishops, archbishops and popes, could not claim that there was no such thing as mysticism. Now, mysticism, too, is almost a phenomenon that deserves a separate course in terms of what is it. Um, but here I'm going to, to define it as an experience of direct divine revelation. There were mystics, there were Christian mystics from very early on, all the way through, always have been. Some were accepted by the church, others were not. The problem is, how do we know the difference? And that's the thing I mentioned in terms of uh, Luther and the Zwickau prophets, which I'll be coming back to, but here, discerning the spirits, how do we know? How do we know if someone has had, indeed, a divine revelation? Because what if that divine revelation is, God has spoken to me and told me, Prince, that you are wrong and you need to stop. Hmm? Or Pope. 
What? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. How do you discern direct inter, uh, revelation? No, you can't. The church can't deny that that is certainly a possibility because Christianity has all kinds of examples of that. Did you know God uh, speak to Moses in the burning bush, tell him what to do? Well, yeah, you can't say no. That didn't happen. That was Moses's, you know, uh, hallucination. Um, but then, what is valid and what isn't? That is the real problem. There's a, a mystical element in all of the radical Reformation movements that was based on individual revelation, on this mystical sense of now we know the truth. Because if you have it directly from God, that's pretty powerful authority. Now, if God says, and this is what I meant by, um, you know, be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That, this is what I meant by it. I'm telling you directly, this is wh what you should do about it. If that's the case, that is, you can't get any higher authority than that. But how do you go about doing it? How do you go about discerning? Because it can be, you know, a ploy. It can be a hallucination, even if you believe that it's the case. That's the problem. That's the problem. I can, you know, I can go into a, a, a church in Italy and, pray before the crucifix and I can have the experience of Jesus on the crucifix opening his eyes and talking to me directly. Now, if I go out and talk about it, that could be a miracle, an example of direct divine um, intervention and revelation, a mystical experience that was genuine, or it could be I'm hallucinating, or it could be I'm making it up. How do you decide and discern? Not only for yourself, necessarily, but if you're in a position of authority. And that is the problem with the radicals. Because it, it could not be, you know, quote, unquote, objectively argued if you're appealing to direct uh, individual uh, revelation. Another aspect is, uh, for all the kind of radicals in general, is, is uh, adult baptism. The baptism was seen as an initiation rite into the community, um, which it was in, traditionally and always had been, but that you, it, it's based on a, a profession of faith. And you can't baptize an infant. Now, I guess in the whole issue of original sin and the effects of original sin and is involved with the whole theological structure. Um, but the idea of baptism being for adults, or at least the age of reason, was a common element, even though there are various different uh, views thereof, and we'll see some of those in, in a moment. Um, because the or, kind of the origins of the Baptist tradition today um, go back to the 16th century, and the Anabaptists or the Baptists at the time, we'll be talking about that in a minute. And then an anti-Trinitarian position, anti-Trinitarian uh, up there is not was not certainly was not uh, general, but there was a faction of the radicals who were anti-trinitarian. What that means is that you know, they denied the Trinity, the divine Godhead, and that God is uh, unity, and that's actually what got. Um, well, I'll come back to uh, next uh, lecture. Michael Cervantes some problem when he went to, to try to convince Calvin that he was right, and Calvin recognized him and says, "You, you know, are a heretic, and you're going. We're going to burn you." And Calvin wanted to behead him, but, but the city council says, "No, we're going to burn you because denying the Trinity is denying Christianity." It's one of the fundamental doctrines. So an anti-Trinitarian, um, according to traditional Orthodox theology, by definition cannot be a Christian. Um, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, now, also a millennial apocalyptic. A millennial apocalyptic, without going into all the definitions there, is that um, the end of the world is coming. The millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ, um, we need to prepare for and to initiate um, and make way for that sense of urgency. Now, I said the the 
Luther had this apocalyptic expectation, um, and he did. So it's not simply a, a defining characteristic in that if you have an apocalyptic expectation that you are therefore part of the radical movement, but a lot, many of the radical ref reformers, figures of the radical reformation, had this sense of this is urgent because the world is coming to an end and we have to prepare for the thousand year reign of Christ. Now, those are just some of the basic things. Which brings us then to the question of when do these elements come together to be um, a program of reformation, or rebellion, or revolution? Here too, it's difficult to make distinctions. I have appeared in the next slide, slide five, uh, reform, rebellion, and revolution. And the first entry there, the Gemeinde Reformation, or the communal reformation, I've already talked about it so, in so far as it's uh, this basis of the commune, the city, the local level, and refer to the Luther having written uh, a treatise on, on, uh, on common chest. How do we organize ourselves? And once we, uh, we break from our overlord, the bishop and the parish, how do we organize our lives? How do we organize our parish life? What do we do about it? Do we, you know, how do we get a pastor from where do we get them? And, you know, do we get somebody that's only going to tell us what we, you know, what, want to hear, or are we going to get somebody who will also teach us and challenge us? That gets to be a problem. And who makes a decision if we don't like our, our pastor, can we get somebody else? Shouldn't we have a pastor from our community that's, that knows us? Um, you know, what do we do with the finances? What do we do with the property? All these issues became very problematic. That local level, that local communal reformation, though, is also the seedbed for radicalization and radical ideas, because people can talk about these ideas. People can talk about uh, the newest developments. People can stir each other up in this local level, and that is kind of the, the, what happened in terms of the eventual breaking out into open conflict with the so-called Peasants' War of 1525. Now, the so-called Peasants' War, it wasn't really just peasants, depending on how we define those. It wasn't simply just 25. It wasn't simply just German. Southwest German, Swiss, um, peasants. It, we have to keep in mind, illegally, everyone who was not a noble, like a knight, or so noble, or a member of the clergy, was a peasant. They were very wealthy peasants. They were well educated in the early 16th century. They were peasants who were very legally classified as peasants, very well educated. Merchants, bankers were classified as peasants. They weren't nobles. And Jakob Fugger, one of the bankers, was banker to the Pope, <laughs> one of the most sought after people. So the concept of who are the peasants, this doesn't really mean um, the poor serf who is barely surviving, living on the land, farming for his lord. It included them too. So the, and a lot of the, the articles of the peasants um, address the agrarian peasant, the peasant in the, on the farms and the fields. But they were written, these... Um, 12 articles uh, by what's called the Stottschreiber, um, city secretaries. They were then kind of fused together these grievances, which had already been there, as I argue, with um, some really revolutionary preaching. And that's where I bring up Thomas Munzer, um, who was a trained theologian, but becomes radicalized. That is a development itself that could be, you know, what led to that, what caused it, what was going on in Munzer's mind uh, that led to that radicalization. We have that question today, um, you know, what causes radicalization, uh, whether it's, you know, Islamic radicalization, whether it's uh, radicalization uh, within this country, domestic terrorists and things. Um, what causes someone to go that extra step to become radicalized? There's grievances. Um, it can be some ignorance, but there's also can be you know, learned people who go and become radicalized. Um, it's not simply an issue of, of education. Um, 
or intelligence, uh, even though it can be. What caused that? And Munzer, as you'll read his sermon, is a real revolutionary. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that. You can read uh, what his comments were. And he was in, very much involved in inciting these uprisings of these peasants who were fighting um, for their rights in their minds. Again, not individual rights, but the rights of the peasants as such um, against their overlords. When it's, you know, with pitchforks, we have images and woodcuts uh, of the, the, the peasant uprisings, which are really a 1524 to 1526. Um, with whatever means they had, with pitchforks, knives, farm implements, scythes, and things. And this was a movement throughout kind of southwest Germany that was far um, greater than any uprising had been before. And the princes put it down. I mean, Luther, um, early on, uh, shows some kind of sympathy with the, the, the position of the peasants, but they... But then he fiercely reacts against it. And he says, you know, uh, he exhorts princes, Catholic and Protestant both, who joined together. They both agreed with this. A rebellious peasant must be put down. There's nothing worse than a rebellion. You do not rebel against the powers that be who are established by God. That's rebellion against God himself. So what these peasants are doing are taking up arms against God and God's established order. That is only the work of the devil, and that must be squished and squashed. And Luther says, you know, slab, stay, slay, and smite the you know, rebellious, murdering hordes of peasants. You will earn your salvation by the amount of peasant blood you spill. Now for Luther, Luther scholars are like, what? How could he say to princes, you will merit your salvation based on the blood spilling killing peasants. Well, Luther said that. Did he mean it? Yes, he meant it. But, you know, he's responding to a particular time. He didn't then make that a platform of his theology. Well, it's a whole other issue. But the 12 articles, which you will read too, you'll see, um, which also in some ways um, can help understand Luther's reaction. They don't explicitly mention this, but behind them are really is Luther's understanding of Christian freedom in his treatise of 1520, then you know, the freedom of the Christian, um, that they then took for social freedom, social equality, social freedom within the context of the government is like Luther says, no. Now, if you look at the, the articles, they're not really arguing for social equality as such. They're trying to get rid of serfdom. Uh, but they're saying, we'll still work for our lords. That's not a problem. Just give us our traditional rights of hunting and fishing. But they are appealing to the gospel. In the last article, they even say, you know, that we are putting these forward based on the gospel. And if you can show us and prove to us where we are wrong, we will rescind them. Same position that Luther took at Worms. And yet, here, Luther says, stab, slay, and kill the murderous, rebellious hordes. What legitimizes revolution? What re legitimizes rebellion? This would be a major question, as we'll see um, in next lecture, with, with uh, in the French context. But was there too, and was going to become one, um, for for Luther and for the, the, the German context as well, because after 1530, the Protestants are in open rebellion against the emperor. And Luther has to justify that some ways. And so if you are a lord, if you are a prince, you have that responsibility and the legitimacy to do that, but not if you're a peasant. And that's what was going on with also, also Luther's problem. Now, that's all about, then again, I said the reorganization of church property and government. I'm not really sure why that, that was there. But it's kind of uh, also a basis for the 12 articles uh, to get that communal reformation of how do we handle church property and government and organize our affairs. Uh, and we want to do so on the local level, not to be told what we're going to be doing. Now, the question then becomes, was uh, the peasant, German Peasants War, so to speak, was that part of the Radical Reformation? 
Well, in some ways, it depends on what you mean by it. Munzer usually is seen as such. Um, but it wasn't necessarily radical in the sense of bringing about something new. It's almost a radical in terms of we want to go back to the roots of what being a peasant meant. Others, uh, reformers, other movements were a bit more radical in that sense. And I have up here, again, the forms of radical reformation, slide six. Um, I'm just going to go through this because, again, I can refer you to... Um, Williams' fat, fake book. If you want to see kind of the, the wide diversity of movements and figures involved in this radical reformation that I have here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five different types or forms of radical reformation. Individual. I have up there the, the example of the Zafikal prophets. Uh, individuals who have received a message and believe that what they need to do to spread their message um, and they become radicalized in that sense. And then the Zafikal prophets there. And then community Communal, um, going back to the communal reformation, I have an example here of Brother Andrew, uh, which is Carl Schott, Andreas Bodenstamp and Carl Schott, whom I talked about, who left and went to, to Orlamunda. Uh, he became known simply as Brother Andrew, kind of eschewing and, and denying his academic background. I'm just a common people like you. I'm one of you. And that is really, he's been, really been seen as... Uh, one of the founders of the Radical Reformation, or in some ways also of the Baptist movement and tradition. Um, and so he's he becomes radicalized in the sense of I'm going to be working in a community on the local level as one of them, throwing away all the privilege of my training, my background, and my learning and everything. So I'm going to use my learning, but for the common people in this way. So that's kind of the communal aspect. And then we have Swiss Anabaptism and Conrad Grable. Karl Stott... Uh, developed some issues and baptism was one of them and Grable uh, and Zurich was another. Grable was a theologian who said, you know what? We're baptizing infants. There's no basis in scripture for infant baptism. Now, obviously, um, from Augustine on, uh, infant baptism was essential and they certainly based their position on scripture. But Grable saying, no, what we need to do is, you know, we haven't been baptized. We're still supposed to be baptized. You know, that's a divine command. What do we need to be saved? Baptized, be baptized, and follow me, says Jesus. I have to be baptized as Jesus was baptized as an adult, as John the Baptist was calling for people to be baptized. And this conversion experience, this initiation. And Grable celebrated the first adult baptism in the sense of baptizing someone, in Grable's view, who had not been properly baptized. This is a problem, because for Grable, Grable's view was if you were baptized as an infant, you have not been baptized, because that is a perversion. So I, we need to baptize you. From the outside position, it's like this is as blasphemous as it can, be, can get. This is rebaptizing. Rebaptizing, or what's called Anabaptism, baptizing again, Anabaptists, and they became known as the Anabaptists, um, were blasphemous. Because going all the way back to Augustine with the Donatus, same issue. It's the work of God that happens in baptism. It's not what humans do, it's not what the priests do. It's what God is doing. And can God work in infants? Absolutely. Are infants part of the community? Absolutely. That's why we have confirmation, once they reach the age of reason, to confirm their baptismal vows. But baptism washes away original sin. To deny infant baptisms, to, do, to deny original sin. What do you do about that? And that you know, it gets very complex. But for the Baptist tradition of, of Grebel and Stending and Karlstadt and thereafter, um, which was, again, one of the general, basic general position of the Radical Reformation, that wasn't the major issue. The major issue was that we are following the gospel dictates of baptizing adults. The opposition was, and that is heretical, and that is blasphemous, how dare you? The Anabaptists were condemned all over by Protestants and Catholics. 
but was a major form. Then we have militant uh, radical reformation in Munster, the city of Munster in, G in Germany in the mid uh, in the 1530s. Um, there was established uh, the Anabaptist kingdom at Munster. Again, Anabaptists, not all Anabaptists were militant, but this form with the names there, um, kind of a slow progression. Malkier Hoffman had provided uh, uh, some of the theological positions of it, uh, Jan Matthijs and Jan of Leiden, John of Leiden, um, established an Anabaptist kingdom in the city of Munster. They actually took over Munster and proclaimed it as a kingdom, the kingdom of the new Jerusalem that was coming. And also, we're going to be following scripture, including the Old Testament, and we are founding a new people essentially. So we're going to also follow the example of the patriarchs and we're going to practice polygamy because we need to repopulate the world with true believers. This too was put down forcefully and cruelly um, and unmercifully. You know, Leiden was beheaded, Long we go. Uh, an example was made out of them. But here, at least, they were trying to establish a political base. It's Munster is a city in Germany, as well as being Thomas Munster. Um, and they were trying to establish this political base for their Baptist, millenarian, militant view. Because it's like, we have to force this to bring this about militarily. Other and Baptists or radicals um, were quite the opposite. They were pacifists. Minnow Simmons, um, the founder of what we still have uh, today uh, in the Midwest, the Mennonites come from Minnow Simmons, the Mennonites. They're pacifists. It's like, no, we. Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. Jesus you know, says, you know, turn the other cheek. This is the gospel is not something that we can be you know, uh, furthered by force of arms. We're pacifists, and if we don't have a political base, so so be it. We still have our community. We'll move around if we have to. Um, and there was large communities of of this type of pacifist. Um, Anabaptism in the Netherlands, so we have Dutch Anabaptism there because it's kind of um, kind of the lowlands in the north and northwest Germany. That it really was a major um, movement there that influences people. No, they don't have a political basis. They are outcasts, but they are outcasts from the traditional magisterial refor reformers. But yet they're still on the local level, on the individual level, influencing people and gaining converts by their examples. Now, those are just some. The you know, individual, communal, militant, and pacifist, um, different types of, of radical reformation. And what difference did it make, uh, aside from being the source of the wrath of the magisterial reformation, the powers that be, um, and if one thing that Luther and his uh, opponents could agree upon is that Anabaptists should be burned and killed, um, that you know, the pe rebellious peasants should be burned and killed, that these people were, did not fit the form. It's one thing for the princes to do something. It's another thing for peasants. It's one thing for cities to adopt um, a, a, a theological platform like Zurich uh, with, with Zwingli and so on, city councils to make that determination. It's another to have rebaptism and have, you know, a kingdom that is pretending to be a godly kingdom. And you can say, well, also the polygamy. Yeah, but you know what? Actually, Luther and Melanchthon, uh, they weren't polygamous, but they actually defended the polygamy of Philip of Hesse. Philip of Hesse, one of the major princely supporters of Luther, had been all along uh, from very early on. Uh, you know, it was Marburg was his council where the colloquy of Marburg was, and Philip of Hesse, as we'll see next lecture or next week anyway. Um, you know, was one of the founders, original founders of the League of Schmalkalden. He had a real problem because he really wanted to get rid of his wife. Um, you know, he said, right, right so Luther the length, and he says, can I just divorce her? Um, and they said, well, no, 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 what do I do? He said, well, he also, because I, you know, 
my, my mistress on the side. I, I want to marry her. And they said, well, you can't really divorce, but at least there is a, a scriptural precedent for, for bigamy. So go ahead and marry your, your mistress, but try to keep it quiet. Now, that was different from the polygamy that was openly advocated at the kingdom of Munster and Luther and the like. were kind of pretty embarrassed about it when it kind of comes out by their opponents um, that they had supported uh, a polygamous marriage of Philip of, uh, of Hesse um, because divorce wasn't allowed. Anyway, that was another issue there. But we look at uh, the impact of these movements uh, the radical movements what difference did it make uh, it didn't make a lot uh, of difference in terms of the politics but it did make a huge impact on individuals as i said the baptist tradition starts with baptists <laughs> the anabaptists in the 16th century that these are movements that are changing people's lives. Even if people like Luther and Melanchthon, later Calvin, as I'll be talking about next lecture, standing in firm opposition to them as heretics, as blasphemers, as agents of the devil. And that's what Luther saw them as. They're all schwärmer, who are like radical, raving people. And it's the work of the devil. Different from, you know, Zwingli, Zwingli was his opponents and has been called Mark Edwards wrote a great book on Luther and his false brethren. You know, the, the, those theologians who didn't, who deviated from Luther, who, who went away from some of his, who disagreed with him. And Luther viewed them as, you know, can we believe some of the same things, but you are going in the wrong direction. You're wrong. But being wrong is not the same as being heretical and blasphemous. Rebellion is not necessarily the same as re revolution. Where do we draw the line with things? That's the question. Another aspect of the Radical Reformation uh, is that they all develop their positions under persecution and or the threat of persecution. Lacking that political base meant that they were outcasts everywhere. How do they handle that? That mentality, we'll see this um, develop more with, with Calvin, what's been called the Reformation of the Refugees, next lecture. But that mentality of we don't have a homeland, we have no place to go. What do we do? Which also is kind of taking up from the medieval mendicant idea of we are following Christ, literally, Christ on earth, no place to lay his head, wandering around, poor and naked, following the poor and naked Christ. That was the mendicant idea, and that was in some ways became, not necessarily by choice, necessarily, obviously with Munster, Kingdom of Munster, certainly not, that became kind of the reality of the Radical Reformation, members of the Radical Reformation, or adherence to the, what reform developments that have been called the Radical Reformation. Because we are the outcasts. That is an important issue. And they continued upholding the viability of individual religious experience and mysticism. Now there's mysticism in official religion too, with you know, whether it be Luther or the Catholic Reformation, or even with Calvin, we're talking about a mystical element. Christianity is a mystical religion in that sense. But here's like, okay, no, we are individual, and we can't have direct revelation. And to this extent, then too, it goes back to this concept of mysticism and dissent. The Radical Reformation was based on kind of individualized experience of divine revelation that they couldn't really be ignored even if they were wrong. And that tension led to question. And they did not have then 
a, a, a place, an official place. And so they're part of this popular religion because they never were legitimized. They kind of stemmed from a popular religion, popular belief, and were denied by official um, religion, by official belief, by official academic theology. They were developing them more a popular theological perspective, a popular religious perspective that then was in opposition to the official religion and academic theology that was being practiced that did have um, a political basis, even if there are disagreements uh, between them. And they remain, members of the Radical Reformation, remain as theological and political nonconformists. Um, and that nonconformity is important. Um, and even, I would argue, if you theologically and religiously are about as far away from being uh, uh, from the Radical Reformation as you possibly can be, that concept of religious theological and political nonconformity is important for the Christian tradition because originally Christianity was not a conformist religion. What do we do with it? What do we do with this revelation? What do we do when Christianity became sanctioned by Rome? What do we do when Christianity became the myth of Christendom? when it becomes the official established religion um, and putting down opposition. What do we do in the 16th century when even if the power structures and who's on top uh, is conflict are changing and shifting around, there's still an issue of authority and hierarchy where people are expected to conform. As we'll see in later lectures <laughs> next week, that's part of the confessionalization process to ensure religious conformity and suffer the consequence if you don't. That radical reformation remains as that reminder that if that is all that Christianity is, it's lost something. If Christianity loses its revolutionary nature, it's lost something. When does the establishment become um, itself uh, heretical, so to speak. Those are the questions, which I'm not going to answer historically or theologically for you right here and now, but I think we need to view it in that perspective, regardless of our background, regardless of our own um, beliefs and theological positions, to look at this development in the 16th century of dissent, rebellion, reform, revolution, what constitutes um, the use of what adjectives to describe the events as we see them, which you will be reading, the 12 articles you'll be reading, the next lecture when I talk about Calvin's uh, in the French context, his letter to Francis. You will read Thomas Munzer's letter to the princes. What constitutes Reformation? And was Reformation revolution? Or was it simply revolutionary? Or did it have revolutionary elements? And how do we come to an understanding of what happened between 1300 and 1600 in Europe? What were some of the transformations? That's what we're looking at in this lecture, which kind of sets up the rest. Next lecture and the lectures for next week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.